Hey everybody, it's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. I'm at the RGS Grouse Camp Tour up in Eagle River, Wisconsin. They thought about it last year and they put this together where they brought in and advertised for people who've never grouse hunted or woodcock hunted to come up, come to some seminars, learn a little bit about habitat, learn a little bit about dogs, with or without a dog, people could come up here. So how did you hear about the, the whole camp? How did well, that get to you? What venue? Well, it's it's very, I'm a very straightforward internet person. Everything I do, I do woodworking, same thing. I, I... A lot of people have asked me like, why do I do it? And, 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 and what makes you keep doing it? And it, it's really simple. Some people say, you know, people with dogs like dogs more than they like hunting. Some people say people who like mountain hunting don't like people. They want to be by themselves. They don't want to see another person. For me, it's, it's, it's dogs and friends that you know and that you've met. And then it's friends and dogs that have passed on in this world. And then it's friends and dogs that you've yet to meet. So I don't see the podcast ever changing. I don't think it ever stops until the day I stop. Growing up in Chicago in the city limits, there really wasn't a lot of hunting. There was no hunting in my family. I, I think my first exposure came literally by going to the barber shop with my dad every three or four weeks. There was always an Outdoor Life magazine or a Field and Stream magazine, and there was a lot of pheasants on the walls and deer heads. And I remember the barber talking with a lot of the guys about fishing trips, and I remember the laughter. I asked for a, a subscription to Outdoor Life magazine when I was in, I think, fifth grade. I would read them till they were dog-eared, dream about all the ads, dream about having a gun dog someday. I, I literally just kind of made it happen. So when I wasn't old enough to buy a shotgun, my dad helped me purchase one. With that, I became somewhat proficient at trap. You know, not I was never on a team or, a, or competition, but I was a pretty good trap shooter. That is a German drilling, or dreiling. Yeah, look down that barrel. The actual rifle. Fast forward a few years, last year of high school, everybody has a driver's license. I've got all my friends interested in trap shooting. We had a huge cemetery, we called it the woods. There was some actual prairie that was still there from back in, from the day when Illinois was a prairie state. A lot of railroad, railroad easements and a, a pretty large wood lot. And that became our, that was our hunting. You'll hear a lot of people say that I took a hiatus from, from hunting when I went to college and it took me a few years to get back or we had kids from the time I was old enough to drive in the car with that shotgun. There'd never been a hunting season I haven't bought a license for. That hiatus never, ex never existed in me. If I had a, an ultimate goal for this podcast, it would be, I'd like to see the demographics of hunting change and be more, more variable, more versatile, like my dogs. It's starting to pull in people from all demographics, all walks of life, and in all ages. And that's the important thing. We have to have a, we have to have a bunch of young people that are gonna stand up behind us and keep this thing like the Grouse Camp Tour going. Because Swede's not gonna be able to do this forever. And if he can't find somebody to take his place, we're not gonna make it. And Habitat's not gonna make it. Wildlife's not gonna make it. And I don't wanna see that day for my grandkids. I probably won't see it in my lifetime, but I want it to be there for my grandkids. I've got one on the ground and two in the oven. And damn it, I wanna see them carrying a shotgun and hunting grouse and birds and owning dogs and all that good stuff that's, that, uh, that I took advantage of in the beginning I took advantage of it by not being aware of it. It was just so common. We felt that by going to a banquet once a year and joining the group, we did our part. And that's not enough anymore. We have to be advocates for it. We have to be Johnny Appleseeds. We gotta get people to feel as passionate about it as I do. If you shoot a wild bird in this country, 
you owe it to the habitat organization that represents it. You owe it to them to support them. And I don't want to hear any different. That's it. I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear, yeah, but they don't do this, they don't do that, they don't spend their, no. You owe it to that game bird to join the habitat organization that represents that bird, that habitat, that ecosystem.